Great. Okay, so it looks like that we have quite a few people who have already called in. We'll probably start a couple of minutes after 10 just so that we'll give everyone enough time to call in and then we'll go ahead and get started. If you're not um, if you're not speaking, we just ask that you please mute your line so that will help to prevent any feedback and it will make it easier for everyone to listen. And then if you have not already done so, please um, log in to uh, ready, uh, go to readytalk.com and use the same access code that you used for the audio login to log into the web and you should be able to see the red KC login screen. If you're having problems, just please send me an email and let me know. Hi, Amber. Hey, Grace. We're, um, I, I just mentioned it. We're going to start in a couple of minutes to give everyone a chance to log in um, online and also to call in. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Hello, we're going to get started in a couple of minutes. We're just going to let everyone get a chance to log in. We'll Great, help thanks, start Amber. in about one minute or so. Hello? Hello. Hi. <coughs> And Amber, this is Eric at UCI. I'm going to have to ring off about 10:30 to go to a half-hour meeting, and then I'll pop back in. So I apologize. No problem. I don't. Oh, I don't think it'll be a problem. Your phone's phone's beeping out. <laughs> it's okay. We're also recording it, so if you miss anything, you'll be able to see. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay. Okay, it's about two after, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, um, I want to welcome everybody to the demo, the first release of the Kuali Koei's Conflict of Interest module. My name is Amber O'Banion. I'm the KC COI Subcommittee Chair, and I'm also a senior analyst who works in the Conflict of Interest Office here at UC San Diego. Hi, I'm Joseph Abraham. I work as a business analyst consultant at Cornell and work on the COI, IRB, and IACUP modules for the Quali Foundation. So both Joseph and I will be doing the demo today. Um, as I have mentioned in my email before, um, we will be recording this demo. You pro if you've already logged in online and um, on the audio portion, it will notify you if it's being recorded. Um, we will be, I will be sending out the link at the end of the demo um, for those who want to review it again and then also if you want to send it to people for them to, to look at. Um, well, there will be a question and answer section at the end of the demo. Um, we will also be um, stopping at various points during the demo to ask if people have questions. So if you want to save your questions for those parts, it will make the demo move a lot smoother. Um, also, we just want to let you know that this demo, we're really, um, considering how much time we have, we're really going to be hitting the high points of the functionality of KCCOI, so we're not going to show you everything that it can do. Um, and also we just want to let you know that KCCOI still is in active development, so there are bugs that are being resolved right now, and they're actually fixing things as we speak. So um, we're going to try to show you as much of the, the system as possible. If there are any errors or bugs, we'll just move forward, but in case you see those, it's not a perfect system yet. It's still being tested. Um, also, if you're not speaking, we ask that you please mute your line so that way it will make it easier for those who are listening and it will also prevent any feedback. And um, 
As part of the demo, I will be doing most of the administrator and reviewer actions, and Joseph will be doing will be posing as the reporter. Um, and so uh, I just want to do a double check before we get started. Can everyone see the red login screen now? Yes. Yep. Perfect. Everyone can hear us okay? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Well, we'll just go ahead and get started. <laughs> so for the first part of the demo, we're going to be talking about the financial entity functionality and maintenance. And basically what we did in KCCOI is we created a separate financial entity area for the reporters so that it would allow them to create and edit any active or inactive financial relationships that they have that's outside of the disclosure process so that it would aid in you know, the timely and accurate reporting of those relationships. And it also makes it a lot easier for the reporter because they don't have to wait until a, a disclosure comes for them to actually update that information. So what I'll do is I'm just going to give you a very brief tour of what the financial data or financial entity um, looks like, and then how a COI administrator, basically someone who's not a developer, can go ahead and edit that information um, if they need to to be able to customize it. And then Joseph is going to show how a reporter would complete that. So um, I'm going to show you here. So this is basically here is our our data matrix that we created. So instead of presenting the reporter with a bunch of questions that they'd have to answer, what we did is we distilled those questions into a matrix and created categories, and then the different answer possibilities are just rows that they can select um, that you can actually edit and create yourself as a COI administrator. So as you notice here, there's different categories such as like ownership interests, office positions, intellectual property, there's other um, categories here. And then these different columns for, you know, if, if they're reporting for themselves or their spouse or their children, this is completely customizable. Um, how many um, different categories of people you want them to disclose for, you can have as few or as many as you want. So let me show you just very briefly where they would go. I'm not going to actually edit anything. Um, but I just want to show you where an administrator would be able to edit this and how they could do it. So for instance, if let's say they wanted to change these different categories, maybe you want to have you know, more than, you don't want to have ownership interest or you want to add it, another category, you would go here to the maintenance screen. I will log in. <coughs> and you would pick here entity data groups. So this maintenance screen is basically where an administrator can go and edit different things. We're going to go here to the conflict of interest box, and we're going to go here to entity data groups. And if you do a search, you'll be able to see the different groups that are currently active right now. So as we saw here in the matrix, um, you can see that there's, there's ownership interest, uh, intellectual property, the different categories. You have the choice to edit this. You can copy it, you can delete it, or here at the top you can create new. Now let's say you wanted to change um, some information in one of these categories, like let's say offices and position, and I will bring the data matrix back over here for us to look at. So here we're at offices and position, and let's say you wanted to add or remove one of these rows, partner, employee, or agent. That's also very simple. What you can do is you go back here to the maintenance screen, you go here to Entity Data Matrix, you can do a search, and the search will show you all of the current rows that are, that are active, and you have the choice to edit, copy, or delete them. You can see what kind of um, field they are, whether it's a checkbox or a drop-down box, and then you have the choice to create new here. So that's basically, you know, kind of in a nutshell how a COI administrator would edit these. And then now um, Joseph is going to show us how a reporter would actually go in and create a financial relationship. Thank you, Amber. So as a reporter, I may have relationships with financial entities that can impact the projects I'm working on. So the system allows me to define and maintain a list of these financial entities. So let me log in as a reporter with the name, with the username Byler. And let's say I have a financial entity relationship with the company Apple, 
that I need to declare within the system. So the way I would do that is go into this financial entity link here, and I would click on new financial entity. So this opens up the financial entity sections here. The top section can take financial entity details, which is details for the Apple uh, company. The relationship details panel, as Amber just explained, allows you to define what kind of relationship I have with Apple. Like, do I own stock? Am I getting you know, some consulting income? Do I have a position on their board? And so on. And then you also have the ability to add attachments uh, pertaining to Apple within your profile. So let me just go and get started with entering Apple, the, the company's details. And there's a shortcut to do you know, the details for Apple company here, and that's using the sponsor code lookup. So if I just do a sponsor code lookup and enter Apple with some wild cards, I can select Apple computer from here, and that takes care of auto-populating many of the fields here. For some that are not populated, that simply means that within the database, Apple computer was not defined, let's say, with an address line one. So I can just put in you know, the address here directly. For the type, I'm going to choose Apple company is a for-profit organization. The status code and the public-private are set by default. The website uh, one and website two are additional information I can provide here. And I'm just going to enter the fields with an asterisk, which are mandatory here. So I can just say software. And that kind of takes care of filling in the financial entity details for Apple Computer. And now for the relationship data matrix, which is customizable by each school. Let's say I want to indicate that I have a 5% ownership interest in Apple. So I can use this column here for self which means I'm reporting for myself, not for my spouse, children, or somebody else. And I can also indicate that I have a board member position in Apple. So to do that, I'm going to check this box saying other managerial position, and just enter board member here. If that's all I want to indicate here for my relationship with Apple, I can go into the attachments. Now this is a neat feature that was introduced after the initial release of financial entities. And here I can permanently attach uh, a document that can further describe what kind of relationship I have with Apple if I need to. So I can just say my agreement with Apple, and then choose the document to attach, and click Add. So after I've done this, I can go ahead and submit. And the system will tell me that the financial entity save has been completed. And now if I go into My Financial Entities, that's where I can see my existing list of active and inactive financial entities. So these are companies, as a reporter, I have some kind of relationship with that I wanted to declare. So you know, I added Apple just now for this demo. But uh, before this demo, I already have IBM as an active entity and Johnson & Johnson as an inactive entity. Great. So um, are there any questions on that so far, what Joseph and I went, went, went over? <laughs> hey, Amber, how do you get the sponsor table loaded? Is that something that you can pull in from your current um, contracts and grant system, or is that something that you'd have to go in and, and manually enter into the system? You have a choice of whether you want to maintain your own sponsor table that's separate from your contracts and grants table, or whatever table you want to point it to. So you can have a table that's just in conflict of interest if you want to like keep those um, financial entities separate. Or you have the choice of being able to tie that into whichever table you like. If you want to use your sponsor table, that's from um, uh, like your contract or grant system or whatever system you end up using. Amber, this is Jill. Very stupid question, I'm sure. When you're <laughs> attaching do when when a reporter is attaching documents, where are they pulling that document from? Um, the document that they're attaching. Yeah. 
So it's, it's anywhere on their computer or their shared drive, whichever document okay. they select. Like. All right. Okay. Can it, yeah. All right. No problem. Amber. Hey, Amber. This is John. Uh, on that relationship detail, mm -hmm. if, if an organization chose to, an institution chose to uh, not use that, I know it's very configurable. What if you didn't want to use it at all? That would be. Uh, I don't. The way the system is built is that it, it is part of your financial entities. If you wanted to do something and you didn't want to use it at all, it would it would create some some dependency issues within the rest of the system. Um, we're going to be just showing like how you can exclude financial entities from other dis types of disclosures. So if you wanted to, you could. It would just be really difficult and interesting. <laughs> we we can talk about that offline, but it would be really hard if you didn't want to use the data matrix. Okay. And why is why is student a category? Um, that's just a, a standard category that we had that we used from another system. It, it doesn't have to stay in there if you don't want it to. You can remove it. It's just it's just like you know default data that's in there. Is that from the IRB? Um, no, it's from COIUS COI. They had student as a a, a, a um, uh, disclosure or who the well, I under team. I understand that, but the, when when you described it, you described it as a as a somebody reporting for the student, right? Uh, so that yeah, that's what COIA COI had in theirs, and since we have to be equivalent with them, we okay. mimicked that that um, that column. So it's default. You can remove it if you want to, if you don't want to have it in there. Okay. Amber. Yes. Um, what is the criteria that determines active versus inactive financial entities? So um, if you if a, re a researcher goes in here and they're looking at their financial entities and let's say that their relationship with with um, Apple is no longer active, like let's say their consulting agreement has expired, and they no longer within and it depends on each institution's reporting requirements. But let's say maybe that relationship, that consulting relationship with Apple, happened in 2010, and it ended in 2010, and now it's 2012, and they haven't had an active relationship with them. They can go ahead and deactivate and say it's not active any longer, or if they no longer have the equity. It just really depends on how your institution is going to implement it and how you're going to um, basically work on. Um, Training your investigators to say, okay, at this point, this relationship would no longer be active. So it's just based on those action buttons. They're not. It's not looking at a date somewhere. No, it's not. It's not. Okay. It's all on the deactivate and activate button. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, great. Well, now we're going to move on to um, doing event disclosures. Okay. So, so let's now assume that the reporter Byler has worked on a proposal development project. What the system will do is that it automatically detects all the projects that Byler is a key personnel of, and it will expose that through a list, uh, through a link here called New Project Disclosures to Complete. So logged in as Byler, if I click on this list called New Project Disclosures to Complete, it will list out the proposals, the, the IPs, the awards, and the protocols for which uh, the reporter Byler needs to disclose on. So, so right now, like I said, Byler is listed as a key person on this project, so I need to disclose. So I'm going to click on this link called Report COI. It opens up what is known as the disclosure form here. So this top panel is, it has a mandatory field that can be easily removed, but it's there in the test system, so I'm just going to put in test here. The reporter panel is auto-populated with details from the system about Byler. And it also has a little panel here to show the unit uh, information for Byler. The questionnaire functionality has been uh, developed. And, and what this means is that for, for different events within the system, like a protocol proposal award, you can have different questionnaires deployed by the institute. So if your school wanted to ask a different set of questions for proposal versus, let's say, a protocol, they could do that here. Right now, we haven't deployed any questionnaire here, so you're not seeing anything. This next panel called Project and Financial Entity Relationships, this is one of the main panels within this disclosure. And, and what's happening here is that the system automatically pulls the active entities, the active financial entities that Byler has, which in this case is Apple and IBM, and, and presents it here for Byler. 
And what Byler is supposed to do is, is to you know, look at the relationships he has with Apple and, and IBM and then see how it may or may not impact the proposal he has been listed on as a personnel. Uh, for the sake of this demo, let's assume that there is no relationship, so I'm going to use this button called None to mark it unrelated. I could have also used the button All to say related. And I can also put in additional comments here if required. The two other sections in this uh, disclosure form is uh, notes and attachments and then certification. So notes and attachments, you know, as the name implies, it allows the reporter to add notes and attachments to this disclosure as they're submitting it. So let's just say I want to add a note here. And there's a neat feature here which allows the reporter to also select the financial entity the note is related to. So if I click on this drop down here, it shows both my active entities and I can say this note pertains, you know, more for IBM than for Apple, so I'm going to select IBM and I click on add. And that would add the note to the disclosure. I can do the same for attachments and just you know fill out the mandatory fields here. I'll just say it's a test attachment. I can associate it to a financial entity here and then select the file from anywhere within my system. So that takes care of adding my note and attachment to this disclosure form. The last panel here is certification. So the text you see here is customizable by each institute. Uh, this is the, the demo test data we have. And if I uh, check this box here, the system will display a submit button, which is the way I would submit this disclosure. And at this point, I have gone ahead and submitted this disclosure into the, into the system. And if I click on New Projects for Disclosure now, I no longer see this proposal which was listed here. So, so this is a very dynamic list that the system you know, takes care of updating all the time as and when uh, the reporter is listed within different projects at different statuses. So I think I can now hand it back to Amber to show you know what happens with this disclosure once it's submitted. Okay, so now that the disclosure has been submitted, I'm going to log in as DOI administrator, and I want to be able to assign this to reviewers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the central admin tab here, and I'm going to look up event disclosures. So these are all lookups, and, and these are dynamic. I love these lookups. So I can look at all the event disclosures that have been submitted in the system that are currently in the system right now. And it automatically generates a list for me here. So now I can see that um, Byler, I, I look for Byler, and I see that they, they routed this proposal for a review. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to open it. OK, so I'm going to come here to the Disclosure Actions tab, which, if you notice, didn't show up for the, for the reporter. It only shows up for the administrator. Amber? I'm going to come here to Reviewer Actions. Amber, you I'm opened gonna... the wrong one, I think. Gregor, not Byler. Byler's disclosure was one above in the lookup oh, results right. that you had. Okay, I'll go back and do it. <laughs> okay, so I thought that's the one I opened, but I could be wrong. Okay, so I'm going to open the right one. I'm going to open Byler. Okay, I, and I'm going to go back here to disclosure action. And I'm going to come here to review your actions. And it, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, as you can see, I could do it for any one of them that's been routed for review. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to add new reviewers. I'm going to add uh, Chu as a reviewer. I'm going to add, and these are easy. Um, as you can see, if you know the reviewers, or if you know their name, it's really easy to add them. And there's also a look up here if you want to look up a list of people to be able to add them as reviewers. And then now that I've added them as reviewers, I'm going to go here to my administrator actions. And I want to say that this, this is now under review by COI reviewers. 
So I'm going to click Set Disposition Status, and I'm going to choose Under Review by COI Reviewer, and I'm going to click Submit. And okay, and I'm going to click close, and I and I should be able to see now when I go back to look at the event disclosures that this is now under review by the COI reviewer. Nope. Let's try it again. See if it works. And this is what we would call a bug, but let's let's see if we can if we can fix. Okay, so this is done. Go down here and it says position status under review by COI reviewer. Click submit. I don't think it's doing it. I think it did do it this time because I see it on the top right hand corner under review by COI reviewer. Yeah. Okay. So we can see here, and then we'll go and look through event, pull up the event disclosures again. And now it's under review by COI reviewer. Okay, so now I'm going to log in as a COI reviewer. Let me log out, and, and I'll show you. We'll show you what a COI reviewer does for review. Okay. So I'm going to also go to the central admin tab here. And as a reviewer, I'm going to see all my disclosure reviews. And this lookup is going to show me all the disclosures that have been assigned to me that I need to review. So here is the one that Byler submitted. So I'm going to click Open. And right now, for the first release of KCCOI, the reviewers will enter their comments here in the Notes and Attachments section of the, of, of the disclosure. So I will put in my note, approve, disclosure, I can type. And then um, I have the choice of saying this is restricted or not. So basically I can make this private or, or so that the reviewer or the reporter can't re see it. But the COI administrator and other reviewers would be able to see my note. But since this is a public note, I can I don't need to restrict it, and I can click Add, and I can see that my note is done here. So now um, I sh I should be finished, and so the COI reviewer or reporter should now be able to look up in their disclosure and see that I have done my review. Amber, mm -hmm. um, did you say the restricted? doesn't allow the COI administrator to see it? No, it does allow the COI administrator to see it. It doesn't allow the reporter to see it. Okay. That's, that's what I thought you meant. <laughs> yeah. Sorry if I misspoke. That's okay. Okay, so Joseph is now going to show what the reporter can, reporter can see. Okay. I'm going to log back in as Byler, the reporter. And as a reporter, I can see uh, the disclosure details at, at any stage of its life cycle. So there's a link here called All My Disclosures. So if I click on this link, it will show just the disclosures that I initiated. And this is definitely not expected, so let me try it again. Okay. So it pulled up a list of three disclosures, and I can see the one that Amber just uh, added a note to as a reviewer also listed here. And the disposition status says under review by CUI reviewer. The status is routed for review, and I can see that it's a proposal. So as a reporter, if I open it, I should also be able to see any unrestricted notes that the reviewer may have added. So I clicked on the Open button here, and I'm navigating to Notes and Attachments. And ideally, I would have expected to see the reviewer's note here too, because it uh, was not restricted. But I think this is, this is one of the areas where, where there is some work still going on. So this is something that will be fixed in the near future.
So let me hand it back to Amber to show how the CUI admin is going to approve this event disclosure. Okay, so I'm going to go uh, ahead. Hi, I'm sorry, I have a question. Um, sure. I noticed a disclosure uh, number ID. Mm -hmm. Would the reporter have to track that uh, a unique number identifier? Actually, no, because uh, KC has a very interesting way it tracks disclosure numbers. So the disclosure number, irrespective of what kind of event it is, is going to be the same for that reporter. So if it's a different reporter, it will be a different disclosure number, for, but for one reporter, all their disclosure, whether it's a proposal, proposal or a protocol or an award or even their master disclosure, there will always be one common number. One common number? Okay. Yeah. Is there any way the reporter would have a differentiating which disclosure was which on that one screen? Yes, um, and, and this is you know something that will come uh, through a Jira that's been uh, that's been deployed already. There is an internal tracking number called the document ID, which is a five-digit number, and even though it's it's kind of an internal number, that will be displayed along with the you know disclosure number, and that document number is unique for any transactional document. So that number will be different for a proposal versus a protocol, uh, but the very you know functional disclosure number will be the same across uh, all disclosures for a reporter. Okay. Okay. Just hopefully that open, uh, answered your question. Yeah, I'm just wondering if there's a list of you know when you click on all my disclosures as a reporter and there's a list of 20 there. Um, and it's something that a reporter wanted to review. Um, or perhaps that wouldn't be where they would uh, try to access any of them. Right. Well, um, and after we, we show you the approval, we're going to show you how they can actually look at their master disclosure, which will show them all of their disclosures that have been approved. And it'll, it, it actually uh, will show you like the title and and all those other differentiating factors. On the All My Disclosures, the lookup that we saw, we, we saw that it was just basically you know, what type it is, like, you know, protocol or proposal, and then the, um, the, the document ID and the disclosure ID. So it, okay. yeah, okay. We're, we're working on that right now. <laughs> uh -huh, thank you. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it's not, as Joseph noted, you know, we have already submitted a, a bug request fix for that so that we can change it so it's a lot easier for the reporter to use. Great. Thank you. Hey, Amber, one more question. Sure. Can you, can you add different types of disclosures? I know in the system it said protocol and award. Um, can, you, can you add other types? Yes, you can. And we'll be showing that a little later in the demo okay. today. Okay. 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 Okay, so now we're going to just go and we're going to complete this, this, the life cycle for this disclosure. We're going to actually go ahead and we're going to approve it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to, I'm going to go back here to the central admin tab. I'm going to go back to my event disclosures. <clears throat> I'm going to see that this one by a Byler still routed for review is under review by a COI reviewer. I'm going to open it. And I'll be able to see when I open the notes and attachments, or I would have been able to see the notes that have been completed by the UI administrator or the UI reviewer. So as I, as we talked about before, the administrator should be able to see the notes that the reviewers have made. But this is a bug, so I will go here to disclosure actions. I'll pretend like I saw it, and it told me that it was approved. So now I'll go here to the administrator actions, and I'm going to select approve. And then here, so this is the primary status, so it's approved or disapproved. And then you can choose, you know, if it's approved, no conflict exi exists, and that's what I'm going to choose. But you can see this is a customizable list that you can have for the different other um, statuses you want to put in there. I'm going to click Submit. And it'll tell me that the review is being processed, that the document is being processed. But when I go back here to Event Disclosures, I should be able to see that it was approved. So it's filer, no conflict exists, it's been approved. Hooray! So are there any uh, questions about that before we move on to the next part of the demo? 
Okay, so Joseph is now going to show us the master disclosure and how a reporter can go ahead and if there's a change in any financial entity relationship, how they can make that change and change their disclosures. Thank you, Amber. So once any disclosure related to a reporter has been approved, it aggregates within what is known as the master disclosure for the reporter. So now that the proposal event disclosure was approved by Amber as an admin, it will now appear in the master disclosure other, along with any other approved disclosures. So let me just click on this master disclosure. And this is, you know, this is read only. You can't update it. You can just see it. There is a way of updating it, which we'll show a little while later. So within the master disclosure, you have different panels for awards, proposals, protocols. So just to see the one that Amber just approved, if I click on proposals, it shows me this proposal disclosure, and it highlights it in yellow just because, just because the master aggregates all approved disclosures. The yellow highlighting is a way to indicate this was the last disclosure that got added to the master. And if I click on the awards panel, it shows a previously approved award disclosure that was done before this demo, and so also with the protocol. There was a previously approved IRB protocol disclosure that you can see here. So this is the read-only view to the master disclosure. So let me go back to the researcher tab here. Now, after the reporter's disclosures have been approved, there might be a situation where there's some kind of change in the reporter's financial entities or a change in their relationships. And, and this may require them to re-update all their pre-existing relationships for approved disclosures. So let's assume that out of the reporter's three financial entities, they want to update Johnson & Johnson, which was an inactive entity, but let's say they have you know, revived their relationship with Johnson & Johnson and they want to make some changes. So what they would first do is they would activate it and the simple click of the button you know, moves it from the inactive list here to the active list. And once they have it here, they can once again edit it and make sure to you know, reflect their current relationship with Johnson & Johnson. So let's say now they have a 30% interest in, in you know, ownership interest in Johnson & Johnson, and that's what they wanted to update. And after they have updated, they can go ahead and submit it. So once an entity has been activated, it will now start appearing in the master disclosure. So previously, you wouldn't have seen Johnson & Johnson, but now that it has been activated, you will see it. And let's, you know, let's, just, uh, let's just look at how a reporter can now submit a master disclosure update to redefine you know, their relationships with, their, with the different projects. So I would use this link called Update Master Disclosure. And this is same as the master disclosure view, only it's, it allows you to update. So the structure is very much the same. There's an award panel, which initially hadn't shown Johnson & Johnson, but I can select that now. So now I can define that you know, with this award disclosure, which has been approved, my relationship is still unrelated. So I'm going to choose unrelated on these. Same with the proposal that Amber approved as an IRB administrator. The system preserves the earlier entries I had made for Apple and IBM, and it allows me to select the value for Johnson & Johnson, and also with the protocol. And in all these panels, you have this all and none button, which, which helps you to you know, auto-populate all these rows together with, with a single click. I'm going to choose unrelated for these two. And just save to preserve the information I've entered so far. So like with other disclosures, uh, the system does give you the option to, to add notes and attachments to the update master disclosure. 
And you can also deploy a questionnaire. If your school wants to deploy a questionnaire for Update Master, they can do that too. For this demo, I'm going to open the certification panel and submit this master disclosure update. Joseph, can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Um, the comments box in these, in these uh, uh, panels here, is that where the reporter can add comments for someone? So if he was updating his Johnson & Johnson to show unrelated, what is the comments box after that? What is that yeah. meant to include? So, so this is where they can you know, put any additional Anything. detail if they want to. Okay. But those comments will be reviewable by the administrator? Presumably they're comments for someone, for the administrator, for himself. What are they supposed to be? So, so these comments are really you know, relevant to their disclosure submission. Okay. So, so when they are submitting this master disclosure and they are saying you know, unrelated to Johnson & Johnson, if they want to provide you know, any other explanation here, any okay. extra explanation, uh, they would put it here and, and the admin and the reviewers would be able to see okay. that. Thank you. Okay. Which projects show up in the master disclosure? Any, any project that has an approved disclosure is going to show up here. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions on Update Master? Hey, Joseph? Yeah. The box to the left of Entity that says Review, and then you have the View, Edit, and History buttons, what does that do? Where, where do you see that? Um, you see where you have the entities listed, and then there's a left box to the left oh, of okay. that. Yeah, yeah. So, so this, um, okay. So these three buttons are directly tied to Apple Computer and you know, so on with Johnson & Johnson and IBM. So even, even though you're within a disclosure, the system still allows you to go back and let's say you want to edit your relationship with Apple. It allows you to use this edit button and go back to Apple computers and, and you know, re-update your relationship there. And the system also takes care of you know, making sure that all the other instances where Apple is appearing is updated. So that way you know, when this disclosure is submitted to the uh, administrator or to, or to the reviewer, they can see the most current relationship you've defined with Apple. So it's just okay. a different way of getting to financial entities, but from within the disclosure. And then the view button allows you to see a summary view of all of, of your current relationship with Apple Computer, and history allows you to see like the history of the changes that you've made. So if the reporter wants to look quickly to make sure that their relationship is updated, they can click that view button um, to make sure that it has the correct information in there. And then if they want to edit, that leads them to, re to financial IT and allows them to edit it. Hi, Amber. This is Grace. I have a question. Sure. Uh, is there a way to make that comments box something that they have to fill out, mandatory fill out? Because if, uh, especially for the new PHS, if they write unrelated or related, we would want an explanation for it. So is there a way to make that field mandatory? I was going there too, Grace. Thanks. So that's definitely not something that you know, KC provides out of the box. So like, let's say you had to do it at your school, you, you would have to have you know, a programmers you know, build some coding around it to make this a mandatory field. Uh, uh, you know, however, you, you can possibly you know, submit this as an enhancement request, and you know, that might have some traction within the KC uh, world to you know, get this done within KC. Okay. And um, then I had another question. Um, is there uh, the ability by the COI administrator to attach or upload information for the reviewer to look at? They, they would do that through the notes and attachments, and as long as they mark it, actually, let, let me take that back. Um, you know, un unless Amber has a different opinion, I, I would say no, that they can't add an attachment for viewing only by the reviewer. Right. However, you know, this, you know, this being the initial release, the, the reviewer functionality is, is kind of basic. And okay. post 5.0, we are expanding the reviewer functionality uh, which is going to make it much more robust, uh, just like it is in IRB and IACUC. And there they will be able to add attachments that only the reviewers can view. 
Right. But you but right now you can the CUI administrator can add attachments if they like or notes. They can they can add that to any disclosure, whether it's approved or not approved or if it's submitted. So a CUI administrator can add that. But being able to the only thing they can restrict as Joseph said is whether or not the reporter can see it. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, let me let me just go and submit this master disclosure update. Can I ask one more question while you're doing that? Sure. Sure. Um, is there a way if if a if an institution has a you know a small COI committee and they don't have an individual reviewer, but the whole COI committee would always look at all disclosures? Can can a reviewer be uh, a committee, or does it have to be an individual? Would you have to add each individual name? Um, well, it, that would really depend on how you want to do it. You can you, you could name them whatever you want. I mean, you can create a user and you can call it COI committee, and you can you know allow that you know to just put what the committee's recommendation is as kind of like one. Generic reviewer, you could do that. You don't have to add them in. Yeah, that's so you could so you could you could hit you could submit you could the COI administrator could direct to COI committee and something would go to five or six different people rather than having to enter each person on the committee separately into the system. Um, is that? that that would be correct. You know, once once we have the committee functionality tied into this uh, COI disclosure. You should be able to assign to all committee members. Okay, and that's a good question because you know it has come up for both IRB and IACUC also, where uh, you know there's an enhancement right now in place which says that all committee members should automatically be, you know, they should uh -huh. automatically be assigned the right to enter comments into the, the disclosure. Right. Okay. Thank you. Hold on for one second. Trying to find out who's doing that. Okay. It didn't. Whoever's calling on another line, can you please your line or that's really weird. Okay, hopefully it did. Okay. If you got accidentally disconnected, we're sorry. Just please call back in um, if you haven't already done that. Okay, so any other questions? Okay, so Joseph, are you finished? Oh, you are. Yeah, I'm done. I think uh, you would continue from scene 11. Yeah. Okay, so now um, now that he's the, that Byler has actually submitted this, you know, um, updated the master and they need to finish it, then what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and log out and the COI administrator will be able to review this and will be also able to approve it like we would any other disclosure. So we're going to go here to the central admin tab and we're going to go to submitted disclosures. And we'll be able to find the because this is the update master and Byler just did this. Where is it? There's only two updates and I don't see yours. So, so oh, I there think it is. the update in the middle. Yeah, I found it. Okay, so Byler has submitted this. So now I'm going to open it as a COI administrator. I'm going to go back here to our favorite panel or favorite tab, disclosure actions. And as the COI administrator, I oh so before I do that, of course you can see in the disclosure that um, I would be able to look at all the things that Byler has done. What they said it was related or unrelated, I would see their comments. I could see all these things, and I could even see here if you notice here in the review, I would be able to view um, the summary of that relationship, and I could also see the history. But the COI administrator would not be able to edit that relationship because we want the reporter to own all that information. But if we wanted to just have a quick snapshot, we would be able to. So we can we can look at this. But now I want to approve it because I see that there's nothing wrong and that 
and no conflict exists. So I can just go down here to disclosure status, click approve, click no conflict exists, and submit it. And then this will now change the status, and it should change it now to approved, no conflict exists. And it does. Here it is. Approved, no conflict exists. Amber? Uh-huh. This is Grace. Could we, do you have, did, were you planning on doing one demo of uh, financial interest where there is a conflict? I'm just wondering if, if it looks different. It, it does. It, it doesn't look different. We weren't planning on doing it because we just wanted to show you, I mean, given the fact that there are some bugs with the system right now, we just wanted to show you how you could do it. It's really not that different. If you wanted to go in and change it and say it's not approved or it's disapproved or whatever, it would it would basically be the same process. Okay. Okay. But if, you know, if later, if you guys want to have a more in-depth demo, we, could, we probably could do that later. So this is Charlotte. So where are the management plans? And how do you show them in here? So if you wanted to as an administrator to go and open that particular dis disclosure and you wanted to attach the management plan and notes and attachments, you can totally do that. But as of right now, for the first release of KCCOY, there isn't any management plan functionality. Okay. Okay. Are there any other questions for that? Okay. So now um, Joseph and I are going to briefly show you how to do an annual disclosure. Okay. So I'm going to log back in as Byler. So when it comes time to submit an annual, the reporter can initiate the annual disclosure by clicking on this create annual disclosure. And, and what the system does to make it easy for the reporter is that it, it pulls the most recent information from your master disclosure and it populates the annual disclosure with it. So I'm going to enter test in this description field and you'll notice that uh, the questionnaire, th there's a special questionnaire deployed for annual, which is again the case where you can deploy questionnaires for all different kinds of projects and even the master. So this is just a test questionnaire with a couple questions. I'm just going to answer arbitrarily here. And then the award protocol and the proposal panel is same as you saw in update master where you can where it gives you another chance if you want to change some of your previous answers you can change it before making your annual submission. Uh, the notes and attachments is again similar to what you've seen before the reporter can add uh, notes and attachments in. And this is where uh, the, the project selection and the financial selection, uh, financial entity selection becomes more important because if you had to add a note and associate it with one particular project, you can do that here from your selection list here. And, and so also with your entities, you can choose between Apple, IBM, and Johnson & Johnson to associate a note or an attachment to. So, Assuming that all the information has been filled out in the annual, I can go ahead and submit this annual. And the approval of the annual follows the exact same process as Amber showed for update and for event disclosure. So, so we will not show that again. Uh, but at this point, you know, if you do have any questions on this life cycle of event, master, and annual, uh, you know, please feel free to ask. Okay. But, well, okay, but, go ahead. Jill, so the um, the annual d brings information from the master. Does the master also add information from the annual in any way? I mean, I would I would have thought that the annual disclosure was basically your laundry, your laundry list of of financial entities, but it doesn't appear that that's what it is. So you once the go ahead, Amber. No, go ahead, Joseph. So, so I was saying, I, mean, I, I think there are two answers to what you just asked. One is, you know, after the annual is submitted and approved, it does go and update the user's master. So at any point of time, 
the user's master disclosure will contain the, the, the latest, greatest information. But the, but the annual is the, basically the laundry list, correct? The, the annual is uh, the annual you, you saw just now that we submitted uh -huh. is a list of the user's financial entities and the list of the user's projects where they can redefine their related, unrelated status for each of the projects. There is an enhancement in place, you know, which I know Amber has you know, included in that list she showed to the subcommittee last week, where there's an enhancement request to ask for different kinds of annual disclosures that can be maintained by implementing schools. So if you wanted your annual disclosure just to be a laundry list of projects, you, know, you could potentially do that with that enhancement. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other questions about that? So if the master has all of your financial entities and it has all of your projects, what, what's the big difference between the master and the annual? Right. There, at this time, there isn't a big difference. Um, the, the difference between the annual and the master is that the master is the mechanism that you would update any of your projects. So if you have a project that's already been approved, if you need to be able to go in and change it, change the relationship, or change an answer to a questionnaire, or add a note or attachment, you would only be able to do that through the update master functionality. And the annual disclosure basically just pulls all that information, as, as Joseph explained, just pulls all that information from the master and will and you'll have the most excellent information to complete for your annual. The annual will have its own questionnaire and once you submit it will be, be treated like its own disclosure. So currently it seems kind of backwards. Um. Kind of. Okay. But, 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 but it's the, the I mean, this is the first release, and this is this is what we've put in place for right now. Right. We do have some enhancements out there to change it, um, to make it a little bit more intuitive. But considering the fact that your annual happens on a once once a year basis, and your master would be updated every time you submit a project or event disclosure, then that actually would be up to date. Would be the thing that would be you would be touching the most, and you'd be up, you know updating and and using. And the annual would just be something that the reporter would have to do once a year. It would pull everything from the master, and then you would move forward. Yeah, and I can see how this can be used. Uh, this is Valerie for things like the 700 reporting process when you're talking about designated officials that have to file on an annual basis to be able to pull that information out of the master and then have um, questionnaire questions that are specific for that 700 form, that could be very useful, at least on our campus, for this process. And this is Lori. I actually think the way it's laid out now is, is quite intuitive. And, and yeah. especially for <laughs> keeping the, the laundry list of history of everything, every discrete action that has happened and what the end result was, you know, approved, disapproved, no conflict, or whatever the end disposition was. Um, when I've demoed this on campus, people really like being able to see what that long list might be after several disclosures in several years. Yeah, that's what I was that's Right. Right. And it's good for different processes. I know in, in University of California we have um, an academic personnel policy that requires annual disclosure. Right. But, um, you know, being able to um, change the questions on that questionnaire so that it would fit that annual reporting process would be very useful pulling things in from the master. So I think this is a very broad way of looking at the historical financial entities and being able to report on different aspects based on the, the criteria. Yeah, uh, no, I wasn't disagreeing. Okay. I'm yeah. saying that actually is, the annual actually is, though, the, the laundry list of, of entities. And then the master is where, if, if the master is related to event disclosures, then you're going to be pulling things from your annual list to update your master. It seems to me it's, that makes more sense than the other way around because the master is related to events and the annual is not necessarily related to a project. It's just a list of financial entities. Does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> I think based on what you just said, I mean, this discussion has, you know, surfaced multiple times. 
and and different schools have you know different preferences which is why we put in that enhancement saying that if a school wanted to create an annual disclosure that's mm-hmm. just a list of financial entities and not projects you know they should be able to do so Mm-hmm. So we are we are basically looking for some configuration in the system that allows you know different kinds of annual. One could be just a list of financial entities, and the other could be you know what you're seeing right now, right. which right. is a matrix between financial entity and projects. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Is there somewhere? This is Cheryl. Um, is there somewhere that you can look to see that an individual has in fact then filed their annual disclosure? Um, right now there there is. Um, I think okay. I have to log out anyway because I'm I'm going to be in the next part of the demo. So let me log in as the um, as the CY administrator. And I can if I don't think we have any here that we need. To, well, Byler just submitted one, but I may not be able to see it. So I can see everyone who if I run the lookup annual disclosure lookup, I can see. Who um, who submitted and who's been routed for review here? So I can look that up as a COI administrator. But, but you're not you able to find the ones that haven't yet, so that you can follow well, up on them. Well, you see, you have the ones that are approved in the. Uh, well, there, all of these have been routed for review. But if there were some that weren't, I think you can look for the different statuses. So here, here, there's disclosure disposition status code. If if they hadn't submitted yet. You, I think we wait. I could be making this up. No, you can do it. I think we do have a Jira out there right now to be able to create a new lookup for that. I'm not. I know that either it does already exist or it's going to soon. So <laughs> what is it compared to? This is Charlotte. Mm-hmm. When you go to see who has not disclosed yet, what does it compare it to? A list of all the faculty at the university, or a list of all the people who received awards in the last year. What's it compared to? Okay, so that's part of the uh, the functionality we're trying to work out. Because right now, with the COI reviewer, or okay, with this, with the way that the CO, KCCOI works right now, for the event disclosures that are being pulled from KC proposal, award, or protocol, we're actually pulling from the personnel tab there to say everyone who's listed on the personnel tab in, in you know the proposal will need okay. to submit a disclosure. But for annual, there there's no such thing exists. There isn't anything you're pulling it from. So right now we're working on trying to create, um, allowing the COI administrator to go in and say, okay, here's the list of people who need to complete this particular annual disclosure uh, template that I'm creating. And then from that list, being able to see who has submitted and who has not submitted. So we haven't finished. We're still working on that right now. We haven't finished it yet. We know that it's key functionality. I haven't submitted an enhancement request. Um, but Charlotte, if that's something that you think you would be interested in, then I could definitely add you as a champion to that. <laughs> See how I snuck that in there? <laughs> Wonderful. You're you're gifted. That was good, Amber. That was. <laughs> <laughs> and most of these enhancements that that we've already submitted for, we've already written the requirements for. So at this point, it's just it's really ready for a developer. You know, at that point, we can we can move forward. We just need the time to do it. So this is Charlotte with another question. I keep being hung up on the word approved. Does approved mean that you've accepted the disclosure even though you've put a management plan in place? And so you'd say approved with the following management plan? Right. Okay. And you can change this status here, this disposition status here. You can change that drop down list. You can put you know whatever value you want in there. Um, but I think okay. that the, the, the current disclosure statuses right now are just approved and disapproved. Okay. 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 Are there any other questions before I go to the last part of our demo? <laughs> okay. So the final bit of functionality we wanted to show you is that it's there are just going to be some disclosure types that you're going to have that aren't going to be system generated, like the proposal or the protocol or award. Those are all system generated um, disclosure types. But there might be a, a need for you to be able to create a different type of disclosure template that you want them to fill out, and it can, you know, this there could be a, any number of reasons. But we're going to create one right now. So we're going to go to 
In the Maintenance tab, we're going to go to the, the COI Disclosure Event Type. And when you do this, I can search and I can show you. Here are the existing disclosure types in the system. So we see award, manual award, IRB, annual, travel, and then there's some test ones we created. So now what I'm going to do is, so you can see the ones we have here. You can edit, copy, or delete them, but I want to create a new one. So I'm going to come up here to the Create New um, button, and I'm going to create a new one. So I'm going to name the event code 100. I'm going to make this a speaking engagement. I don't want to include this particular disclosure in the annual, so when we create the annual, this event is not going to be pulled into it. I don't want to include any um, financial entities. I don't want to have that in there, and I do want to make it active. Okay, so when you come here to project details, you'll notice here that there is a bunch of, there's an ID label, there's a title, so if you want a title, you can do that if you want them to complete that field. There's a short text field, long text field, there's number fields, there's date fields, there's even a checkbox field here if you want. So I'm just going to go ahead here and I'm just going to create a couple of fields. Um, And then as part and, and, and as you can see I can use any or all of these. And then as part of the um, process, I'm just gonna click blanket approve. That's part of how it cannot be because the newer version of the maintenance record exists. Should I change this? Okay. See if it'll let me omit it. Ta da! So now I've submitted it. So if I go back, if I want to see if this has actually been created or not, I can go back here to the Maintenance tab. I can go to Disclosure Event Type. And if I do a search, ta da! Here it is Speaking Engagement Disclosure. So I know that it has been active. So now, it should be available. So this is going to be different because it's not going to be a system project. So what's going to happen is when the researcher or the reporter is going to report, they're actually going to click Create Manual Disclosure because it's not part of this automatic system. So now Joseph is going to show us how a reporter would be able to do that. Hi, Amber. I'm just mm -hmm. having a little bit of trouble uh, picturing when we would need to do this. Or um, why would we use this function? Well, it, it depends if, you know, different schools have different reporting needs and sometimes they have different disclosures that they need to, you know, that may not be, um, um, that may not be captured in the system like project disclosures. So it, this is just functionality to allow an institution to create a, a non-system generated disclosure to fit any COI reporting need that they might have. Okay. Grace, I'm thinking about things like CME disclosure forms. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> that are not under my purview. Right, right. Thank you. Okay. Amber, Amber, I'm sorry. It's Mary Mallory at UCI. Is there a way to put in a dollar amount so that the person has to report how much they were paid for that speaking engagement, for example? Yes. If you notice, um, I don't. Oh, I'm going to take over for a second, just to log out and log back in really quick. If you notice. Here, go back there really quick. Okay. If you notice that there is a number field here, so if there's in a couple of number fields, so if you want to have them, you know, say please include the amount that you could put that as the label, and then you could say this is the number field, and they would have to put the amount in there. Perfect. Okay. So you could do something like for the school medicine comp plan reporting, you could have like a form electronically that would capture the same information kind of right. thing. Exactly. Perfect. Okay, thanks. And you can also associate, like if, if these are not enough, you can also associate a questionnaire with this disclosure. We're, we're not going to show you that right now. But you can associate a questionnaire with this. In a questionnaire, you can have as many questions as you want in any type of data element that you want in there. 
So I'm going to log out and let Joseph log back in. So now that Amber has deployed a, a speaking engagement disclosure, which let's say all reporters in that school need to disclose speaking engagements. So if, if, if Byler needs to disclose for a speaking engagement, what Byler would do is go into create manual disclosure, and then open up this panel called manual event and financial entities. From here, they would select the event type as speaking engagement. And that opens up the fields that um, Amber had declared earlier, like uh, describe the speaking engagement and title of speaking engagement. There are some system generated fields also appearing here. So I can put in uh, information here pertaining to the speaking engagement. And click on add. So doing this initiates the disclosure form that will now work for the, for the speaking engagement disclosure. And the reason this might look a little different than what you've seen before earlier in the demo is because there aren't any financial entities shown here for Byler, like Apple, IBM, or, or Johnson & Johnson. And that's because Amber had you know, excluded financial entities from being shown on this disclosure. Uh, just like any other disclosure, like Amber said, you can, the school can deploy questionnaires that can capture additional information for this speaking engagement. There's also the provision to denotes and attachments. And the last thing here is, of course, certification through which they can just, uh, submit this disclosure. Probably the last thing I want to show you here is, uh, again, in the create manual disclosure. If I open up the manual event and financial entities panel, you can select an event type of manual award, proposal, or RB protocol. So let's say I select manual award. The system gives me some predefined fields like award number, award title, award date that I can populate and submit. And, and this functionality is, you know, comes into use when, when your school has a standalone KCCUI system where the award and the protocol and the proposal systems are not KC or are not connected to the CUI system. So that's when, if you still wanted to disclose for an award, this is the way you would do it. And I think that kind of covers what, what we had planned for this demo. And, and we can definitely take more questions at this point. I have a question about, uh, and this is a, for the group, I guess, too. What, uh, how are you managing your, your uh, annual reporting cycles? What do you base that on, like a higher date? Or are you guys picking a calendar um, date? And um, how is that handled in the system? Oh, at Iowa State University, we have a calendar date, which is the month of January. And then uh, if they're, for some reason, they get off cycle, it's just every 12 months. At Arizona, we're we're looking at a, we're looking at uh, doing our, our annual notice of appointment reappointment date, which is uh, on the fiscal year July 1st, and then of course at at the time of employment for a new employee. Yeah, and the system basically allows you to set any date that you want to do your annual disclosure process for. It doesn't it doesn't choose it doesn't make you choose your your cycle at it particular period of time. I, I have a, this is Trace. I have a question. Mm -hmm. As a researcher, are there flyover so or info buttons that they can click on if they don't understand the what's being asked of them or the difference between say a manual award versus um, event type, award number, what like an example or where would they find what, it, what information the person actually needs to populate there? So there's a two-part two answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, here you, you notice that there's some questions, like little question things. You can um, open those. And they will, um, there, there is some help information that's, that comes with the system. But mm -hmm. you can also, the, the institution can customize this. They can, they can change this if they like. The second thing, too, is whether or not they know the difference between an annual or, 
or a manual or whatnot. That has to do with the institutional training. So when you deploy this, that's part of the training that you're going to have to do at at your institution to let them know what the differences are. Differences are because you could change the labels of some some of the items, you, and it'll be a little bit different depending upon your institutional implementation. So oh, while they're, while they're actually populating it, there's not the pop-ups or fly flyovers. I don't think we have those right now, but okay. But we but in, um, so we haven't gotten really to the help documentation yet for this module. Okay. But it is safe to say, Amber, that because of the nature of the uh, of the KCCOI being so highly configurable, that there's likely going to need to be a good amount of localization of the online help. Yes, that's definitely 100% true. Because yeah. it, it is configurable. You can, it depends on what you're going to show, what you're not going to show. You can change the labels of things. So a lot of the help that we have right now is pretty generic. And then if you, there's any more additional help that you want to add, that institution will have to do that after you've configured it. And it's all within the standard KC help mechanism, the doc yes. to help stuff? Yes. Yeah, great. OK, thanks. I do know that we are part of, there, there is a move um, because of the infrastructure that, that KC is based off of, which is called RICE. They are adding some additional, more dynamic help links that are going to be available. And that is something that um, KCCOI, we're trying to get our, ourselves on there so we can have those things. But that those are enhancements. It's going to require quite a bit of time. And it's not something that we, is not in the first release, and we're not quite sure if that will be in the second release either. But it's on the list of things to do. Are there any other questions? Uh, this is Charlotte. I just want to make a uh, check, make sure on something. Now I understand that uh, the COI module pulls information out of the other KC modules. Mm -hmm. And am I correct in assuming that the other KC modules, such as uh, awards module, pulls information out of COI? Um, not as of right now, it does not. We're working on integration between, uh, uh, fuller integration between KCCOI and the other KC modules is also another enhancement that we, we're planning for after 5.0. Um, we've uh, basically put together, like basically having a COI panel that would have a list of all the investigators who've Closed, and then the, the very high level statuses of whether they submitted or not submitted, or if it's been approved or not. Um, so that kind of information that requires more, uh, much more developer developer time in order to put together. We have put together the requirements for that, but we're hoping that we can have that for the next release. Okay, great. Sure. Hi, Amber. Mm -hmm. On the master form where all the projects show up. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Those projects are show up only when the the reporter is the key personnel or PI on those projects, or is it just any involvement in any project? So, if they're listed on the personnel tab, so like in uh, in KC, we have like a personnel tab that you can put oh, okay. all the personnel on there. If they're listed on that tab, what we decided to do because that would be the easiest way to implement it um, is that whoever is on that tab would have to. So okay. if there's someone that you, at your school decides you want to include grad students all the way up to PI, then that was something that you would work with your sponsored project staff to make sure that they include those people on the personal tabs for those for that for those modules. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is Janet. I wonder if you could tell me more about the questionnaire function. I, I'm not quite understanding that. Is it is it meant to be able to attach a, a questionnaire? Right. Another form of a document, or or how does it work? So the questionnaire actually shows up as another panel, and let's see if I look. Um, if, if let's let's just open it up one. Okay, yeah. So here uh, in annual, you'll see that there's a questionnaire panel. We have a Jared to move this. It shouldn't be on top. <laughs> um, so you see the questionnaire panel here, and if you click show, you can see the questions that come up for this questionnaire. And the name of this questionnaire is CUI Annual Questionnaire. You can actually create more questionnaires. You can associate them with the different disclosure types. That's all done in maintenance, and it's 
it's a little involved. But basically what it allows you to do is you can create different kinds of questionnaires that you want to have attached to each different kind of um, disclosure type. There's no limit on how many questions you can ask. And there's a lot of different other different types of of questionnaire type question types. So like fill in, yes, no, um, um, free text you know, whatever you want to do, you will be able to do that in questionnaire. It's very flexible functionality. And Can you how do you do reviewers see the the completed questionnaire? Um, um, so could you say that again? I, I couldn't hear you. Yeah, how does the reviewer um, see the completed questionnaire? So when the reviewer comes in to look at it, they'll see that these questions have been answered. So they can o they can review anything that's here. They can't edit your questionnaire, but they can view it. So they would just log in and they would be able to see the answer to your question. Okay, so it's it is kind of populating the annual disclosure form. Right. So this questionnaire, which if I'm the COI administrator, I will create a questionnaire and I'll say, okay, I have these ten questions that I want to be completed every time someone does an annual. So when the reporter comes in to do their annual disclosure, then they'll see this questionnaire pop up with the 10 questions. They'll complete the questions, and then they'll submit it for review. Then the, the reviewer will come in, and they will, they'll be able to open up this questionnaire panel, and they'll be able to see the answers that the reporter has completed. Oh, OK. OK. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Can you and have sub-questions? Yes, you can have uh, the beauty of questionnaires. You can have branching questions, so Great. you can it can be a, as beautiful as you want it to be. Is there anything else? Well, we really appreciate everyone coming to the demo. I know that a lot of people have been very anxious about being able to see KCCOY and what the first release can do. Uh, as I stated at the beginning, this is not everything that it does. There's quite a bit that it does do, and then there's a little bit that it doesn't do. Um, if you would like to know more about KCCOI, you can contact me, and uh, we can definitely get you involved in our current testing effort, which allows you to you know, go through the environment that we're in now, create disclosures, see how it works. If you want to be able to get into you know, the maintenance and see how you can create different disclosure types, things like that, please feel free to contact me because we're still we're still testing KCCOI right now and we're hoping to have a fully tested version by the 5.0 release of KC. Which is at the end Amber, of Shamima. Can you comment uh -huh. a bit about what different we might be seeing uh, or hearing at the uh, KC user conference? Um, the KC user conference, the demo on Sunday will probably be the same. There might be a little bit more that you'll see because the test environment will be more stable. Um, and then, of course, we have our, our two presentations on Monday and Tuesday. One is an instigation inspiration type of thing, a brainstorming session to talk about our current regulatory environment and the tools that are available to us. And then we have our standard presentation on Tuesday. But the demo for uh, on Sunday, I think it's two hours. So it will kind of be the same, but there's more things we'll have more flexibility to look and show you other things with the um, environment being a little bit more stable. And, and so what will be the difference with the Tuesday presentation? The Tuesday presentation is just a basic overview presentation. We might sh we're going to show some basic screenshots of, of uh, KCCOI, but it's going to be very high level. Great. Thank you. Sure. A Amber, could you talk a little bit about uh, being a champion for certain enhancements and how that works? So uh, sure. So currently, KC has uh, done a new um, enhancement process, which basically requires if you're going to submit an enhancement, you have to be uh, a champion. So each enhancement has to have someone who's willing to help write the requirements. So basically, detail out what the enhancement request is, and then also be willing to be the person who leads the testing on that particular enhancement. So for instance, like I've submitted enhancement request for you know having new committee functionality. So I will help with writing what kind of committee functionality that we want. And then once it's been developed, then I'll be taking the lead on testing it and making sure that you know if there's other testers involved that all the tests um, um, have been done. 
and helping to write the, the testing. It, they don't have to do it by themselves because as a subcommittee chair, I will be helping, and so will Joseph as business analyst. So it's basically trying to help to spread out the enhancement workload. Thanks. And that's available to all of our subcommittee members. And to be a subcommittee member, your institution has to be at least a basic member of the KCE Foundation. If you have any questions about that, or if you're not sure if you are, um, just please contact me and I can help you. Are there any other questions? Thanks very much, Amber and Joseph. That was great. Yeah, yeah, that was good. fantastic, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank we'll you. be sending out the link later, and we really appreciate all your participation and good questions. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Please stand by.